All right, so this next panel is uh, going to be chaired by Desiree, our awesome project coordinator. Um, and uh, these folks are going to be talking about how uh, they're using social media, web archives to document communities. So really excited to hear what you have to say. So yes. Thanks. Um, so I'll just go ahead and introduce our panelists to you guys. Samantha Abrams is a graduate student at the University of uh, Wisconsin-Madison and an early career archivist. Um, she works with both the Madison Public Library and the University of Wisconsin-Madison Archives. Um, at Wisconsin, she's working uh, with fellow students to document and preserve materials related to the, um, in, uh, created in support of the real um, UW and its leaders. Um, Brian Dietz is the digital program librarian for special collections at North Carolina State University um, Libraries. He oversees all aspects of managing um, archival digital as assets uh, for the libraries. With his colleague, Jason Kasten, um, Brian served as the co-principal investigator on New Voices and Fresh Perspectives, a project which resulted in the, development, um, in the development of the beginnings of a social media archiving programming, um, a web-based social media archiving toolkit, and the social media combined collecting environment. Um, Jarrett Drake is the digital archivist at Princeton University Archives, where his primary responsibilities include managing the digital curation program, describing archival collections for the Princeton University Archives, and coordinating the archiving student activism at Princeton ASAP initiative. He is also one of the organizers and advisory archivists of a people's archive of, the poli of police violence in Cleveland an independent community-based archive in Cleveland, Ohio, um, that collects, preserves, and provides access to the stories, memories, and accounts of police violence as experienced or observed by Cleveland citizens. Natalie Bauer is a librarian and archivist based in Mexico City, um, and was most recently an archivist at the Cuban Heritage Collection at the University of Miami Libraries. Natalie recently completed a year of research on a Fulbright Garcia Robles Fellowship, looking at digital preservation issues in Mexican libraries, archives, and museums. She looks forward to continuing her work with colleagues in the Americas to solve the information challenges of digital information networks. Um, Samantha, do you want to start by sharing a little bit about the work you're doing at the University of Wisconsin-Madison? Sure. Um, yeah, so I... Um I guess I'll, I'll start at the beginning, where you're supposed to start. Um, I, I am a student at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I have a semester left of library school. Um, I, uh, most of my work is kind of cobbled together because I need to pay for graduate school, and you know, <laughs> you need like three jobs to do that. Um, and so I, um, I, I work at the Madison Public Library doing uh, personal archiving, but the work that I do um, at the University of Wisconsin Archives um, is really centered on um, documenting this movement um, that happened on campus called the Real UW, um, and I don't think anyone in here is from Wisconsin. Um, you're from Wisconsin. That's right. Duh. <laughs> so one person from Wisconsin, um, and you know what Madison is like. Um, the University of Wisconsin Madison is is overwhelmingly white, um, as is Madison. Um, it, is, it is a community where I've been told by several students that I've met in doing this work where they, they would, a uh, student of color would end up on campus and somebody would say, you're the first you know, person from uh, Mexico that I've met ever in my life. Or you're the first black person I've ever seen. Um, and so I say that to just kind of provide a little bit of background about um, how this movement came about. Um, so with that in mind, in this past semester, so the spring semester, um, there was a string of what the university calls hate and bias incidents. Um, a student woke up and found swastikas taped to his dorm room door. Um, a, a black student was spit on um, in her dorm. Um, uh, Native American students on campus um, were taunted with the imitation war chants. Um, and they went on and on and on. And the university's response was to um, have you know town hall meetings about um, how can we solve this problem? And then they kind of swept it under the rug because, um, well, 
because. Um, and so uh, several students um, kind of all at once started sharing stories of what it's what they've actually gone through as a student of color on Wisconsin's campus. Um, and what started as several different hashtags like RUW <coughs> on Twitter or the real UW or my UW um, eventually became the real UW um, and which is T H E R E A L U W. Um, and students were sharing stories of microaggressions that they had faced on campus, uh, straight up racism on campus. Um, and it turned into um, so much more than I think anybody really thought it would. Um, so it grew from Twitter to actual protests on campus to um, staged walkouts of class to uh, art exhibit at the art um, museum on campus um, to another project um, where students stood on Library Mall, which is um, a main like pedestrian mall on campus, and they held signs of things that had been said to them about their skin color, about their sexuality, about their gender. Um, and so it became this huge thing. Um, and I just randomly, um, not affiliated with an organization, started to collect the tweets using Ed's twerk tool. Um, and I, I just wanted to kind of see if I could do it, if I could like collect all this stuff. Um, and I figured out that I could, and then I had 10,000 tweets. Um, and I, I uh, realized that my computer was not the repository for this stuff. Um, but I didn't know exactly what to do. Um, I went to the public library and I said, you know, we're trying to start a web, ar web archiving program. Do you think this is a good home for it? They said no. Um, I, they said it was out of scope. Um, I asked the Wisconsin Historical Society and received the same answer. Um, and so I went to the university archives and they said, yeah, we should be documenting this. Um, it's currently a staff of three people, the university archives, um, and the digital archivist uh, is a position that has been open for several months now. Um, so they asked me to help out as a student. And what, immediate, what was originally this project of like, well, I already have the tweets, I'm just gonna hand them over, became this, this other uh, ethical concern within me that actually maybe I, I shouldn't hand these over. Maybe I should uh, be thinking more about this. Maybe I should be, you know, actually talking to people. And so I, I just, um, I went through all this material and um, person by person reached out via Twitter and Facebook um, and email and, you know, official school forums and started meeting one on one with people who were willing to talk to me. Um, and I asked them questions like, you know, do you want this preserved? Um, we talked, I talked probably with about 15 students um, about the, the issue of housing this in, in the institution that they are trying to, um, you know, uh, what's the word? Trying to, they're trying to raise awareness that the institution is, is essentially ignoring them. Um, and did they want their material in, in control of, you know, controlled by that institution. Um, and, and what really came about um, is this collection where it's very much, um, it's as participatory as a you know, university archive can be in that, yes, we want this to be part of it. No, we don't want this to be part of it. Um, and it, it also turned into uh, two oral histories um, and hopefully more if we can get funding. Um, where I spoke and did an hour long interview with two different students. Um, an Indian American student named Chinar and a uh, Mexican American student named Yasmin. Um, and they, they told me all about their experiences on campus. And, and um, so it's become this really interesting collection that still doesn't have the tweets because um, when, I, when I said, you know, how are you guys gonna provide access to this? Um, do you guys have ethical concerns? They said, well, just give it to us on a flash drive and we'll figure it out later. And so I still have them, um, and they don't, they don't belong in my possession, but I also felt uncomfortable turning them over if there was no plan. Um, and so, I mean, it's still very much in process. I'm still there doing this work. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it really did, for me, turn into um, meeting a lot of people who, just reaching out and asking, like, do you want this in the archive? Can I help you? Um, and sometimes people said no, and that was fine. Um, and sometimes people said, yes, and I want to be part of it. And sometimes people said, yes, but I'm just going to give you stuff on a flash drive, and you do it. Um, so yeah, I mean, I guess that's a, I talked a lot. But 
yeah, that's kind of what's going on at Wisconsin. And um, I know it, it happens that it's been happening at other universities. I know Duke had something similar. Um, I know Clemson University uh, had a hashtag being black at Clemson. Um, so it's something that I've seen elsewhere. So. Brian, do you want to share your experience working with, a, with the university archives with some um, other social media collecting initiatives as well? Yeah, um, so the community that we're focused on is primarily our campus. Um, <clears throat> although the, the last um, project that I'll talk about really sort of extends, uh, just be, be, it's closely related to campus, but it extends beyond uh, the university. Um, so in 2013, we started a project we called uh, My Hunt Library. And this was um, very much a promotion and engagement project. We were opening a new library on campus called the uh, James B. Hunt Jr. Library, named after a very popular governor in North Carolina. Um, and we were interested in sort of um, documenting um, students and faculty and researchers and community members' experiences interacting with the building. So uh, we developed an open source application called Lentil uh, that has a harvesting component, uh, public access component, um, and then things like staff admin moderation, um, publicly, there are like voting and battles. Um, the idea was that the um, photograph deemed to be sort of the most um, popular, the best, uh, the person who took that was going to win an iPad. So very, very much like a lot of promotion, a lot of um, a lot of uh, uh, PR went went into went into the project. One of the I think one of the interesting things that we did with that project is that we had an opt out, you know, donor like so called donor agreement. Um, where we would leave comments on people's, um, on, on their, their images and their, their feeds saying, um, you know, thank you for taking this image and sharing it and we're the libraries and we're doing this and selected uh, photographs will be archived in the university archives as part of, part of university history. Um, that turned out to be a very popular feature. The archiving component turned out to be a very popular feature of the project um, that we found out through uh, tweets through comments left back on um, in you know the, the the comments field, and then also through a small uh, user study that we did, where like oh, something like seventy five percent of the participants said that they were motivated to participate by the fact of their photograph being included as part of the university archives, part of the university history, um, and of the um, nearly thirty five hundred images that received the uh, the opt out um, comment, only five people opted out and they were all folks who wanted us to buy their photographs. Um, so no one opted out in, in opposition. That said, it was a pretty benign sort of, sort of project. We're you know, documenting the, the, the opening of this you know, beautiful library and how people are, are using it in their studies and you know, their uh, interactions and things like that. So fast forward a year, 2014, we received a small grant um, to, like Desiree mentioned, um, start developing the foundations of a social media archiving program. One of the things that came out of that, and this was, would not have been possible without the help of um, five really awesome graduate students. Um, we um, recorded something like 460 official and semi-official university Twitter accounts, and we began harvesting data related to those accounts using Social Feed Manager. Um, we, we have plans to contact, well, I think we already have a relationship with a lot of these units. Certainly not all of them. 400, 460 is a lot of units, right? Um, a lot of them are um, student organizations and we don't, our university archives doesn't have a relationship with every single you know, student organization on campus. Um, colleges, departments, the chancellor's office, all of these, you know, all of these units that are using social media to uh, engage with their community. We have, you know, established relationships with them. Um, so I think there's a lot of work to, um, to reach out to these groups to say, this is what we're doing, but it's also an opportunity, I think, to, to establish additional um, relationships that could potentially lead, in ad lead to additional materials being uh, transferred to the, to the archives. So just sort of continuing to increase the um, diversity of voices and perspectives that are represented as part of the university's history. So about halfway through that project, um, in February 2015, there were um, three Muslim students who were or had been affiliated with the university 
uh, were murdered in Chapel Hill, and the, mur the murders were definitely motivated by um, their, uh, the religion. It was a dispute with the neighbor. Uh, the neighbor clearly um, you know, had, had demonstrated sort of hatred for, um, for Muslims, and it, you know, it, it, it led to this, um, to this killing. So, you know, I think in a way, with the, with the technical apparatus in place, but probably not all of the like social or archival apparatus in place, um, we began collecting that, that, um, that data. Um, I think we perceived it as an opportunity that would, um, um, we, we didn't want to miss out on having that data represented. Um, so this, in a way, the data produced um, through these, I should say that um, there are a couple of hashtags that um, that relate to the, um, to the that are popular on social media related to the uh, the killings. One is our three winners, which is something that's been promoted by the university, but also the families of the uh, murder victims. And then there's Chapel Hill shooting, which I think is sort of a probably a, a wider, a bit of a wider net. Um, we have harvested um, over 600,000 tweets related to Chapel Hill shooting in, in our three winners. It, it, um, shortly after the murder, it was, it was trending internationally. So this is something that started on campus, part of the campus community, and then really sort of expanded. Um, and also additionally, um, about 20,000 uh, Instagram images and, and associated metadata. I think that this is also an opportunity for us to at least engage with the, with the family, which could lead to additional collecting. Um, um, certainly more voices than just the family and even more voices than just those who are um, supportive of the family or celebrating the lives of the, of the victims uh, have used those, um, those hashtags to, to communicate their sort of you know, opinions and images about being Muslim in America or the shooting in general. Um, so in a way that's, that poses a little bit of, a, of an issue for me, like if we were to offer an opt out with this data, I think we would, um, we would over represent the sort of positive responses and really under represent the negative responses, which I think is our part of the, part of the story. Um, so I'll leave it there and maybe we can talk about some other things during the Q&A. Thanks, Brian. Jarrett, do you want to talk a little bit about the work you're doing? Sure. Um, so I want to draw in a few points that were made by both Samantha and Brian. Also circle back to the panel earlier um, with the, the folks from St. Louis who were uh, on the front lines during um, the aftermath of Mike Brown's murder. So that August of 2014 was a flashpoint, obviously, locally and nationally. And one of the outcomes, um, I should first of all state a little bit about my context. So I'm the digital archivist at the Princeton University Archives. Um, I've been there for almost almost three years. And um, one of the things that I immediately recognized upon the start of the 2014, 2015 academic school year was a heightened level of student activism and student engagement with political and social issues. Um, there were a number of groups across the country that were started right after Mike Brown's murder. Um, as sort of a local campus, like Ferguson response team, right? So like, uh, there were a lot of schools in Missouri that obviously had organizations formed, but at Princeton there was also a group uh, whose Twitter handle is actually at PU underscore Ferguson. Um, one of the starters of that uh, uh, organization, which is now uh, developed into a group known as the Black Justice League, they uh, formulated as a direct response to like challenging the, the racism, the, uh, the, the classism, all of the isms that uh, our university perpetuates. And uh, this was a common thing, again, at many colleges. So that's where this project, Archiving Student Activism, at Princeton really kind of starts. It, sort, it starts with this resistance from students uh, who are impacted by Ferguson either because they are from here, which one student in the group uh, she is from, from St. Louis, um, and bringing their, their resistance, their their activism back to campus. Um, so 2014, 2015 school year, uh, students at Princeton and at many universities, they stage die-ins, they stage protests, some faculty members participate in these die-ins, uh, some people in this room may have participated in some of these die-ins and some of these uh, action, direct actions. Um, and really the, the flashpoint for, for when this project, Archive and Student Activism at Princeton, really takes off, um, it, it's so funny how, how fate comes together uh, this was like the third week of November in 2015. 
Uh, I had just gone to a panel on, Tuesday, on a Tuesday at Temple University that Meredith was a part of, Burgess was a part of. Um, I think Ed may have been joining us remotely. And uh, the three of them uh, in this whole, whole panel, they were talking about uh, capturing the Ferguson hashtag, right? Um, so this is on a Tuesday, and then Wednesday I get to work, and uh, I get an email about like students that have taken over Nassau Hall, which is the main administrative building. And so just less than 24 hours after hearing all of the experiences with uh, capturing the Ferguson hashtag and the different considerations, I was faced with this like in real life. And uh, I really didn't know what to do. I wish it too, like documenting the now existed then, um, because maybe it would have given us a practical way forward. Um, but we knew that uh, being in the University of Archives and, be and being in this sort of renewed wave of student activism, which, by the way, uh, should be stated that the, the takeover of the administrative building at Princeton was part of a larger series of protests and direct actions at colleges known as student blackout. Um, student blackout uh, was the hashtag that was used in, in mid and late November. And um, so upon like sort of just grappling with what to do about all this Twitter data that's being generated, a lot of Facebook content that's being generated, the hashtag used locally at Princeton was hashtag Occupy Nassau. Um, I really struggled with what to do, so uh, I did what I tend to do when I struggle with things is I went to Twitter and I asked my colleagues at other college campuses, what are you all doing to like document student uh, blackout on your campus? And what are you doing uh, th to ensure that you proceed in a way that's ethical, that's responsible, and that's critical, right? How do we, as university archives, not position ourselves as like the state, right? Which to many students, we are the state as, uh, as dictated by our mandates and sometimes our connection to power. So how do you ethically uh, uh, document this, this um, th these developments without being another arm of surveillance, another arm of monitoring. So uh, I went to Twitter, a lot of people responded positively, a lot of people in this room re responded positively. And so we had uh, about 40 or so archivists on a conference call. Um, I wanna give credit to ERA, who's a digital archivist at the University of Cincinnati for really taking a big role in organizing this conference call. And uh, Burgess was on that call, a lot of other people, and we were just like, talking shop, like what would you do to document this, uh, th these series of protests on, on your campus? So um, after that, uh, that phone call, we, for which we had homework that was assigned. Um, if you're at all curious about what that homework is and you wanna do it, you can uh, add me at Twitter and I'll send it to you. Um, but basically we wanted people to read in advance of this call and come with some substance uh, to, to discuss these issues. So fast forwarding, what we decided that we would do um, with, with all of the social media content being shared around these protests at Princeton was that we wouldn't just crawl the Occupy Nassau hashtag. We decided not to do that. And we decided not to do that for a few reasons. Um, we didn't want to uh, surveil students, honestly. Um, some students were using uh, other kinds of accounts to share their comments about this uh, protest. And we didn't want to get uh, into a situation where students are already a vulnerable population in general in terms of the data that they generate, um, and especially students who are marginalized on their, on their uh, university campuses, we didn't want to further exacerbate any sort of uh, inequality or surveillance that they already experienced. So we said we're not going to, to crawl the Occupy Nassau hashtag. Um, what we decided to do was that we would um, uh, contact the organization responsible for the, the, the sit-in, um, the Black Justice League. So what we did is we had just recently uh, signed our contract with Archive It, uh, which is the service offered by the Internet Archive. And we said that uh, Archive It, in their, um, in their application, there's a way to crawl a, a particular URL to a website, but to keep that private. Um, so while all this was going on, while the students were still negotiating, while all of the like, you know, the, the crosshairs are still really very much uh, uh, active, we decided that we would crawl um, to both the Twitter and the Facebook feed of the Black Justice League, but keep all of that private and keep all of that hidden until and unless the, that student organization gave us consent to do it. Um, uh, we were prepared, if they said no, we don't want to be archived to delete that content, 
uh, because with archive you can basically do like a provisional like crawl where you don't actually save the data. So um, I was I was prepared to to delete it. Um, we we waited until things settled down and then we reached out after uh, students had got a chance to to um, to go through the holidays and sort of like just clear their minds. We said, hey, we crawled this content. Uh, is it okay? Do we have the, your permission and your consent to, to keep it? And that's what we ended up doing. They, they said yes. And um, so that's the, the sort of larger aspect of archive and student activism at Princeton. Uh, a, lot of, a lot more things came after that in terms of reaching out to other organizations on campus, but I really wanted to center uh, both the students in the Black Justice League who, uh, who forced this issue at our university and also center their agency as well. Because I think that's a big, uh, big part of, of thinking about ways to do this kind of work ethically and critically. Um, and uh, I think that there, there are things in the works that we can do to try to document the issue of institutional racism uh, and, and other kinds of uh, inequalities at, at my university that um, partnering with student organizations in a way to like sort of use the archive sort of as a repurposing of, of what an institutional archives is. It's challenging, it's, um, it's thankless, but I think that um, we, we can use the archives at our institutions to do a lot more than what we have been doing. And that's why I'm interested in this, in this tool in particular for its uh, abilities to do that. Jerry, can you also just take maybe just a couple of minutes to talk about the people's archive for police violence? Yes. Um, wow. A couple seconds. I'm, I'm <laughs> like, there's so much. Um, I'm, I'm particularly interested in how it came about and, and the commitment from other archivists to, to stand by the community in that, that archive. Well, look at this table. Look at this room. <laughs> These people mixed uh, have contributed to all of the, the work of of People's Archive of Police Violence in Cleveland. In a, in a nutshell, it started because the professional organization for archivists, um, and I use that term very loosely, had a conference planned um, in Cleveland, Ohio last year. And we, uh, as a group of archivists going to Cleveland, Ohio, had obviously just um, been paying attention to the murder of Tamir Rice, uh, the, the, um, the un- uh, unacknowledged murders of uh, Timothy Russell, Melissa Williams, and so many people in Cleveland. And we said that, uh, quite frankly, we'll be damned if we show up in Cleveland and don't do anything about this, right? Like, we're coming into the space, we're spending money at hotels, we're spending money at restaurants. Uh, at the very least, we need to come here and, and show out. So that's, uh, we used Twitter to organize this very sort of agile, in the moment response. And, um, Stacy mentioned this a little bit earlier, and she deserves a lot of credit for taking, uh, for, for, for positing that when we go to Cleveland, maybe we want to generate some more oral histories. Um, there was a, an activist organization that had already uh, held a tribunal on police brutality in the city. Um, and so, I mean, honestly, it was, it was 75 to 80 archivists that are involved in either planning for the development of the archive, transcribing interviews that we did with people on the street, um, and it's, it's still here a year later. It's archivingpoliceviolence.org. Um, there uh, there's a, a bevy of, of literature out there about, about the project now, but um, I mean, really in terms of the people, it's folks in this room and folks who are probably watching um, who gave money, who gave uh, time and, and gave labor to the development and the, the organizers in Cleveland on the ground who have been, much like the students at Princeton, I center them in the Archive and Student Activism at Princeton project because they resisted, right? They spoke up, they put a lot on the line. And the same thing with the folks in Cleveland, um, both the community organizers and the survivors, right? Their like resistance is what gave, opened up this opportunity, right? We didn't just go in there and, and start like archiving police, like, it, like these people are the living archives of the, of the violence that they've endured um, from the hands of police in, in Cleveland. So that's, uh, that's an ongoing, ongoing project. Thank you, I appreciate it. Natalie, so you're working, uh, your work with the University of Miami and then also your work in Mexico City, you wanna share a little bit about that? Sure. Um, so at the University of Miami, almost two years ago now, I can't believe it's been that long. Um, on December 17th, 2014, um, both the US government and the Cuban government announced the changing or reestablishment of diplomatic and political relations between the two countries. And um, 
I'm the, I was formerly the archivist at the Cuban Heritage Collection at the University of Miami Libraries. And um, because the, that collection and everybody that worked at that collection was very in tune with um, U.S.-Cuban relations, the Cuban community, both in South Florida and, and beyond, um, we kind of knew the news was probably going to be coming soon just from watching what was going on and different um, events leading up to that December 17th official announcement. So we were kind of on edge waiting for it to happen. And so when it actually did happen, um, business pretty much stopped that day um, for us in our office because it was such a big piece of, of news for um, the people, you know, everybody that that works at the Cuban Heritage Collection and just Miami in general, um, being such a large community of Cuban and Cuban American exiles. Um, so one of the first things that we, I mean, even though we knew the news was coming, for some reason we didn't really think like, well, how are we going to document this when it actually does happen? So it happened, and then we started to think, how, how can we spring into action um, and make sure that we have a record of this here at the collection? Um, because it, it's an, an announcement more than 50 years in the making. So I mean, people been, had been waiting for that, that news for a really long time. Um, and also, to just thinking about this community building, um, you know, really being conscious of the fact that the Cuban exile and Cuban American community is not a monolithic community either. There are a diverse um, range of opinions and reactions to that event, even though it is often portrayed maybe in mainstream media as, you know, everybody has the same opinion about what happened. So we wanted to be really careful to make sure that what, however we decided to collect or document what was happening that day and the after effects of it, that it um, was not a monolithic sort of portrayal of what was happening or people's reactions to what was happening. Um, so we were aware of the work that was going on with the documenting the Ferguson Movement um, by Ed and Burgess, and we knew of some of the tools because of that. So we decided to launch our own um, collection of certain hashtags related to the US-Cuba policy change starting that day and then about a week or so afterwards. And so we got in touch with Ed and, and Burgess and had a, a conference call. and. It was a really good thing that we did because, I mean, when it happens like that and you're like, oh, we can collect this, this stuff, and there is that assumption, well, it's out there and you can just collect it and do whatever you want with it. But then once you start talking to other people that are doing similar work and there's a community of practice, you realize that it's not such a simple thing as that. And there's a lot that you have to think about. and you really just need to take your time. So it's like documenting in the now, but, and you want, there's this like urge to do it now, but really is that gonna solve our ethical problems as we've been talking about a lot today? So that was sort of the wake up call for, for me anyways, and I think my colleagues at the University of Miami, we were able to, to collect these things and um, store them and, provide some access to them. Um, but there still are a lot of those lingering questions. And a lot of the lingering questions have to do with community, what community you're documenting. I mean, it's not just like you're documenting, oh, people are just talking about this news event. You know, This is affecting people's personal lives, their family ties. Um, there are a lot of issues with um, dissidents in Cuba that are that are getting their messages out through Twitter and a lot of times if you amplify those voices there are serious repercussions for those people that um, 
well, one, they don't want to leave Cuba because they're active dissidents in Cuba, but they also need some level of anonymity so that they can continue to to do their work where they need to do it, not in exile, but actually on the ground in Cuba. Um, so there were just a lot of things to think through, but it's you don't always necessarily have that time to think about and work through those questions when you only have the, what is it, seven days or whatever to collect what you need to collect. So um, it's kind of a comforting thing to know that a lot of this is going on, there, everybody has these questions, and maybe we have the data, but it's good to know that just because you have it doesn't mean you need to like put it out there or share it or, or jump to, to do something. Like sometimes it's okay just to sit back and, and, and see kind of what happens. And so with the work at University of Miami and the Cuban Heritage Collection and kind of collecting the re reactions toward this very international event um, is really relevant in the fact that now that I'm in Mexico City and that this project is mostly US based, um, just having had now two opportunities to think about this space of Twitter as not just operating in a vacuum of like US events, U US issues with social justice, um, it really puts it into a, a more global context. And it really stood out to me today when Kayla Reed said that it really impacted her whenever she received the tweets from Palestine. And it's really putting the social justice movement and what's happening here in a different context that maybe we don't Im immediately associate with what's going on in other countries, but you know, it's state violence. And like when you think about it that way, you have a lot more in common with, for example, what's going on in Mexico and archives of the disappeared and people being murdered by government officials, basically. And I think Twitter kind of closes closes that gap a lot and I think this is a really critical moment for this project to kind of see what we're trying to do. Community building, yes, in very discreet, specific communities, but also this global community of um, documenting um, activism in a much broader sense than not just what's going on here, but also connecting the dots um, beyond the United States and I mean I don't have a really simple am answer for it and I know the contexts are very different but I think this project could really um, have a really huge impact not just for what's going on here in the US but what's going on beyond um, and in different languages and different communities and um, I don't know what else to really say. But um, I think that, I mean, I haven't really started my work yet in Mexico. Uh, professionally, I was doing a research project there. But I'm hoping that being part of Doc Now and um, being in, in Mexico City, I mean, Mexico is our neighbor, you know, the US's neighbor. There's just a lot of opportunity to kind of push push the borders on, on what we're trying to do here because people are, are going through a lot of similar things beyond the, the US experience, so. Thanks, Natalie. And I'd like to come back to you yeah. in a little bit about some of the practical implications for thinking about this work internationally. Um, but I also want to give some time for the, the audience to ask some questions. For that, though, I'm going to take my chair roll and ask a question of my own. So. Um, particularly Brian and Samantha, but also you as well, Jared, working in a university context um, about events that are happening inside of a university. Um, when you think about, because you guys have differing levels of resources in your department. So when you think about how to make the case uh, for particular, for resources to be allocated to a particular issue or topic, what are some of the considerations that you guys take into account? Um, what are some of the tactics or arguments that you've made um, when not everybody sits in rooms like these to think about these problems and, and why certain topics are important for collection or discussion? Yeah. Um, uh, so 
So I'm a student, and I kind of operate from the um, um, what's the worst that's going to happen to me is uh, I lose my student job, and that's fine because it pays, you know, an hourly wage. <laughs> Um, I'm not a for tenure. Um, I, you know, none of these things apply to me. I have that that privilege, and so I um, I've just been kind of doing things, and then saying I did this thing, and they're like, oh great, because we don't have time, um, and so it's worked out in my favor. Um, and you know, I will say, I think that that the a staff of three is is impossibly hard to do anything, um, and they do great work, um, but you know. Um, I have a I have a wonderful classmate and friend and colleague named Harvey Long, and he did this this he he spent and I think he's going to continue and do his PhD about this. Um, started looking for for Black Lives in the archive now and found nothing. Um, and so when when and he was I you know one of the first Black students to even work at the archive as a student and. And so when, when you're thinking about having these conversations, it's really ridiculously, um, it's not possible to do unless you inv invite these other voices in. Um, and you know, that's easy for me to say as a white student. Um, but I, I, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that we can start to have these conversations, um, especially at, at every institution that I've worked for in Wisconsin. That is overwhelmingly um, the you know privileged group of people um, to start having these conversations, saying you know what maybe these aren't even decisions that we can make even if we are the archivists. Um, why don't we ask, you know what what did you find, Harvey, and what can we do better? And um, you know and obviously that's not Harvey's job. Um, he's got other stuff to do, and I'm just talking about him. But. <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, um, and so to answer your question, um, actually, like collecting these stories and and these oral histories, for instance, um, having the employees sit down and actually listen to the oral histories um, and say, like, I didn't know about that, or um, I passed Jarrett's article on about archives for Black Lives. Um, uh, yeah, like resources and and meeting with different people. Um, because you know the three archivists who work there, it's 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 a university archivist, an oral historian, and a records manager. So mm -hmm. they're not even doing work together, really. They have their own stuff, and so mm -hmm. it's been remarkably difficult to really do anything. And it's something that they face every day. And so adding this this layer of really important work, they agree that it's important, but mm -hmm. they don't really know. And I don't know if that answered your question. No, uh, thank you. I appreciate but, it. Um. I want to echo a few things Sam mentioned. Number one, shout out to Harvey Long. Um, Harvey was one of the students who recorded interviews in Cleveland on the streets as well as other graduate students, so shout out to y'all. Um, the other point about like asking permission, right? That's something that um, comes up a lot in our field. Like, How do you advocate for these things? How do you get the, like, the, the time and the space. And uh, my approach, which is rooted in a lot of privilege, both uh, uh, gender, uh, sexuality, uh, educational, all these different privileges that I have. Um, I'm a, on the tenure track for librarian. Uh, so I have all of these, these privileges. Um, and I think it's really incumbent upon people in those uh, spaces of privilege not to really ask for these things, but to like take it, honestly. Um, I didn't thankfully have to do a lot of convincing for uh, with my staff um, about about this the necessity of this work, um, but I also really wasn't going into it like with like can we do this? It was like this thing needs to be done, and here's why, right? Like if we don't grab, if we don't if we don't think about how to capture this stuff, we can't wait for 50 years down the line uh, to to grab it and then um, hope that it's still there. Uh, I read this wonderful article that I encourage everyone to check out by an archivist from Kent State. Um, I can't remember, her name is Lael Watkins. Um, I can't remember the title of the article, but someone on Twitter certainly will, because Twitter is great. Um, but uh, she talked about this like uh, documentation project that they did at Kent State to, uh, to document the black campus movement, right? And she talked about you know, reaching out to people who have been away from the university for 40 years. And so in this case, I was like, we can't do that. Like, we gotta grab this stuff ASAP. So like the acronym was, was 
on point for a lot of reasons. Um, because if we don't get this, it's going to be gone. So I didn't have to do a lot of convincing. I didn't have to do a lot of rationalizations. Um, and I also really wasn't prepared to. I was just like, we got to do this work. And uh, thankfully, I had supportive folks in the University Archives who, who, who were on board with that and uh, who helped develop this project as much as anyone else did. Fantastic. And we also had a ton of support from our um, library from, you know, the, the top down. Um, <clears throat> I mean, with, with, you know, again, My Hunt Library being this sort of promotional project related to the opening of this sort of signature building, um, our directors were very interested in that project. Um, we're a library that's very interested in um, emerging areas of work, and I think that it, especially in um, technical areas, but I think that extends to other areas as, as well. So, you know, the, the libraries, we had to have directors support our application to the state library for funding we just can't you know submit that application we would have that would have been bad to have to have done that without um, uh, permission the 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 main guidance we got from our um, our uh, assistant or associate director was we're not archiving all of Twitter right and that, that and that was fine and I, I think that it um, it helps to be able to uh, scope your collecting to your existing collecting areas because you've developed strength in, in those areas for reasons. You can tie some of the social media data where some of the ethical issues start to get a little bit gray. They're tied into your, your collecting areas. We're very interested in rolling uh, this program out into our other collecting areas. It's just really sort of easy to do the university archives. And there's, there is a big push within uh, the university, but um, the, the library, but also within the university to, to be very engaged in documenting uh, the university's history. Um, the project was, um, so Jason, Jason Kasson and I were PIs. He's in digital library initiatives. Um, we also had um, guidance from Will Cross, who's our director of our um, Copyright and Digital Scholarship Center. He's like the, he introduces himself as the lawyer in the library. Um, we had uh, support from other staff members in DLI and other staff members in special collections as well, inc including like our head, our university archivist, the curator. Um, usually what we do, since I'm not a curator and Jason isn't a curator, is uh, if, if, we, um, if we identify a, a, a tag, we'll usually pass it to the university archivist to get um, his sort of input, like, yes, this is something that we, we want to be harvesting or or no, um, re sort of related to that, one of the things we're really interested in is building better curatorial tools to help identify basically like trends, like ideally what would, because it's very difficult to keep track of all of the hashtags that are gonna crop up on campus, but if, it's, if stuff is sort of surfacing within the data, then we can sort of assess it and say, okay, there's, you know, there's a reason to be harvesting this data also. Um, it sounds like that there might be a little bit of that built into Doc, no. Sure. Yeah. I'd like to leave some time for questions from the audience. I guess while everybody gets their sea legs about them. Uh, I'd like, Natalie, if you can maybe speak a little bit about um, some of the practical implications of thinking about web archiving internationally and thinking about recording conversations internationally considerations, and, and I think you brought up some really cool practical ideas when we've talked before too, so. Yeah, um, I don't know when it happened. It was several months ago um, when Spanish became the second most used language on Twitter. Um, before it was Japanese, but then Spanish overtook it. Um, so I think, you know, one way that and even for U.S. contexts as well, um, Span well, the U.S. will be the largest Spanish-speaking country in the world by 2030, um, if that trend continues, um, is by building that into our tools, um, not just the, f the, the front ends and the back ends and in different languages, but also the documentation, um, you know, uh, for how to use the the tool in, in other languages besides English. Um, also, um, 
I think too, thinking about this internationally and like the legal aspects of things and the ethical aspects of things is we're here in the US where we're used to a certain legal system, justice system, but that's not always the case in other countries. Freedom of speech laws are different in different places. So having just that awareness, if you're going to build a tool that could be used by communities beyond your sort of borders, um, you know, taking those ethical and community considerations and also um, into consideration would be really important. Um, I believe you also mentioned some things about uh, potential holes in the collecting and the resources and that we shouldn't assume that the conversation is um, completely surveyed just because we uh, searched it on Twitter. I think you gave the example of the um, the difference in how Twitter is used when you're not using a smartphone phone versus oh, when you're yeah. using it. Yeah, so for example, um, one of the issues with collecting the tweets from uh, the people in Cuba at the time of the announcement, now there's more access to Wi-Fi in Cuba because of the opening of the, the, the ties between the US and Cuba. But at the time, the only way really to live tweet anything um, was through a analog phone, non-smartphone, I guess you would call it. Um, so there was a way to like send a text message to Twitter and it would post your tweet, but you couldn't have conversations on Twitter or interact with people that were interacting with your tweets. So that had a lot to do with, I mean, so it's kind of like you're blind tweeting, you know, you're just like putting information out there, but you're not getting anything in. You, ca you can't interact with the hashtag at all. So that also represents um, issues with, I guess, the data analysis side of things. Can you talk about um, what things you put in place to sustain your project, particularly relationships with community? If you were to leave tomorrow, what would happen to your project? That's a great question. Uh, <laughs> Not, I've, we've done nothing. Um, yeah, I mean, um, I'm working on a grant to continue doing oral history work. Um, ideally, we would be able to pay, pay the individuals that we interview because they're students and they're taking time out of their day and, um, you know, saying like, well, we'll buy you a cup of coffee really isn't that big of a benefit to anyone. Um, but, you know, um, yeah. I, <laughs> nothing. I mean, it, yeah, that's all I really can say, I think. Nothing. <laughs> um, at Princeton, one of the things that I tried to do, uh, and that I'm still trying to do, it's an ongoing process, is make the archive more accessible to students and to student organizations so that, um, you know, regardless of staff uh, who, who are there, like, they'll sort of know that, you know, this is how you go about transferring content to the archive. Um, uh, so I think that, that that's one way to, to sustain it. Um, we also had a, um, a student, an undergraduate student working for us with the project um, in, in the second uh, semester of the last academic year. And I think that was a, a huge contribution. Um, and uh, so, you know, involving students, involving other staff members, I think is, is really important. Um, I mean, the, the re reality of it is that unfortunately a lot of projects do you know rely on certain people being there and um, it's something I, I think about and I don't know if I've always uh, if, if there are um, as, as viable solutions to longevity that we want um, but you know I think by bringing in other people and getting other people invested uh, uh, I didn't talk as much about the st different staff members at Princeton who have been involved in this, but they all have been involved in some way. This hasn't been like one rogue operation that I ran. Uh, not that I'm uninterested in doing those things, but I just know that's not like how sustainable organizing works, that you gotta bring in uh, different people so that they can carry it on. So um, I guess Tom will really tell if in five, 10 years, people are like, ASAP, what's that? Like, guess it didn't work out too well. I think we I think we'll do a good job. I will say that the project at, at the UW um, is contingent upon the hiring of a new digital archivist. Um, and so when I talk to my supervisors as a student, I say, "Well, what about this decision? Well, 
the new digital archivist will make that decision when we hire them. And that's all I can do as a student, so. So I'm going to ask one of those questions where I'm not sure what I'm asking yet. Um, <laughs> um, so kind of one of the things that it's interesting that we're here now from in this panel from where we sort of started and um, moving through sort of digital humanities, activism, um, uh, the panel on social media research and data. I think I'm missing a panel in there, and and it's it, the kind of convert the way the different ways people are sort of talking about what gets collected is interesting, like thinking about it um, as evidence versus, you know, thinking about it as intellectual production versus thinking about it as text and, and all those kinds of things. And so I guess I sort of have a question that is about, that was sort of Meredith's question, <laughs> that was about the way that you as archivists interface with the community, that we interface with, whether it's activists or students, students or activists, community members who are um, everyday folks, as they were saying on the last panel, they become activate, activated. Um, but I think it's also a question about the ways that really, like what you guys are, have done, it also shows how we're, how all of us are sort of talking about two knowledge, not two, but like maybe multiple knowledge systems that are coming into kind of fundamental conflict with each other, right? So there's a way of thinking about archiving and collecting material that is about like get everything, you know? And if you're not getting everything, then something fundamentally is wrong. Um, on the other side, what's also coming up, there are ways that people want to be anonymous, people want to be invisible, it's not safe for people to be visible or known. It's like, how do we bring those together? How are you guys, how all of us, you know, I guess you're going to have folks from the last panel too, going to be able to, or, or thinking about how we bring, like bridge that, like how do we bring that together? Um, are we talking about basically creating a whole different way of archiving, I guess is sort of what I'm saying. Like, I think there's a tension how some of us are talking about our disciplinary training versus, you know, and I like fitting this into what we're already trained to do as journalists or historians or whoever, and then versus like, like really radical, <laughs> <laughs> really like radical, like creation of a whole new system and a whole new way of thinking about knowledge. Is that what we're doing? I hope so. <laughs> That's, I mean, honestly, I, I've, I've talked about it a lot in public and written about it a lot in public that I don't think that we need any tweaks to the archive. I think we need like transformation to the way that we think about the creation of records, the, the ownership, the agency uh, bound within those records. I don't think that uh, the, the way that your mainstream archival education programs go, I don't think they prepare you quite honestly to do this kind of work. So many of us in doing this work, we've had to read uh, outside of our discipline very widely. Some of the people in this room, we've had to read and talk with you all about the things and the ideas that are permeating in your field. So I, I, everybody here on this panel may not agree with that, but it's certainly been my, my argument that um, if we're going to do this work responsibly and critically and sustainably, that we actually kind of got to start building something new that doesn't rely on these, you know, this violence of the archive that you um, elucidated earlier and um, that, that just perpetuates itself over time. Um, we need to think about, about ways to just reimagine and, and liberate ourselves from the, from the uh, uh, oppression, the structural oppression that's built into the current ways of doing archives, all the way from access to to appraisal, all of it, start over. Yeah, and maybe potentially also um, with what research looks like, because I, I think that we can, in a way, we can take a cue from you know like um, critical data studies folks who are saying, you know, well okay, fine, you don't have to get IRB approval because IRB doesn't cover public data and this is all public data, but there are other things that we can do or to put into place. And I think that the, the labels idea or like um, data tags that deal with, you know, how, uh, how a researcher should uh, think about sharing his or her data based on like some of the confidentiality issues that are likely to, to be part of that. Um, Included in the data set, like I think those are those are like potentially strong models that that could guide us um, for how we talk with our researchers about about this stuff. Yeah, um, I, I'll just add that um, a lot of times when I when I've talked to community members and, and students, I'll, um, 
starting with, like, can you come meet me at the archive um, instead of starting there? Because the response to that was, um, I don't know where that is. <laughs> um, I start with, like, I would love to talk to you about the work that you've done. Um, and then I have asked the question, do you know what an archive is? And a lot of times they say, I have no idea what the archive is. And um, I know undergraduate classes tend to go into the archive maybe once um, and like use a primary source for your paper. And they like look at it for two seconds, grab a quote, and then, you know, they're, they're done. Um, so like part of my thing is I hope, um, and I do this with the personal archiving lab too, archival education and saying like, um, but like, you know, person to person archival education. Not like, oh, you don't know where an what an archive is? Here's some Jenkinson and like, <laughs> <laughs> um, but like, oh, well, feedback. this is what an archive does. And these are examples of other, like um, there was a great project, I too am Harvard. And it was, that's not a, that's not a technical like archive, um, but it was more closely related to what these students wanted to do than anything else, so. <laughs> I wanted to follow up and ask, in, in working with um, community members, I, I'm thinking back on, on the young people who were talking about getting um, radicalized by, uh, by Matt Brown's murder. Um, in working with um, the community members you worked with, do you find that learning something about archives, like you're saying, does something for them too? Like besides sort of giving us something to look back on, is there, you know, like how is that process for them? Like how do they think about that? Is there Yeah, I've had two, I've had maybe two or three people um, after the fact contact me and say like, well, can you show me, like I have these emails, can you show me what to do with them? Or um, I have all these pictures on my phone, can you show me what to do with them? So it's like little things like that. Yeah, and I mean, I'm still very much in contact with uh, the students who are responsible for uh, bringing about these critical conversations on my campus. Um, and uh, I think that we, we definitely have opportunities for a future collaboration um, in terms of using existing collections and, um, and expanding that to uh, different communities. So one of the, the um, communities that we, uh, I think, have a, a better relationship with now than we did at this time last year is the Latinx community on campus. Um, a number of students in the Latinx community at Princeton, um, they actually created a petition. And this was, I, of all the petitions I've ever seen, this is the only petition that I saw that said, like, basically the university archives is too white. Like, that's kind of what they said. They didn't, they didn't put it in those words, but they were like, we can't find representations of our uh, former selves in this university archives. Um, Y'all need to do better, right? So um, I think that, uh, so over, we've had conversations with them, um, with members from different uh, groups and organizations within that, within that community. And I think it's creating a real sense of connection and belonging ultimately. I mean, because in a lot of ways, that's what one of the things that the archive does, right? Is it shows you who belongs and who doesn't. Right, it shows you whose whose uh, lives matter and whose lives don't matter, um, and I think it's specifically with the with the Latinx community, um, Latinx communities at, at Princeton. There's uh, a, a real tangible like benefit to uh, these these projects, and um, there's uh, a, an alum conference coming up later this year that we're in. Uh, talks about doing some sort of larger documentation project with alums, Latinx alums from, from the university to, uh, again, just um, s draw that connection to belonging and, and sense of place. So that's a real powerful, you know, that you talked about, someone mentioned earlier about bringing the humanities into the digital humanities. That's what it's really, really about um, for, for me. <laughs> so thank you to the panel. Thank you. Thank you.